Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you find yourself today. My name is Valerie Hope, and I am your host for this wonderful show called Time to Come Alive. And I say wonderful because it's my show and I get to call it whatever I want. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you chose to listen, to watch, to participate today in any capacity that you have found yourself right now attracted to the show. I feel like this is just an opportunity to bring about more consciousness for yourself and your community, for your world, also an opportunity to connect more deeply with yourself, with other people, and ultimately that allows us to be even more creative. As you know, every week I have a, a phenomenal opportunity to connect myself with a guest, and sometimes the guests I know well and other times I don't. And in this case, this is a guest that I'm getting to know I'm so grateful to invite you to, to listen today as I talk with Dorsey Standish. She is the chief mindfulness officer for her organization, and we'll talk about that in, in a bit. But more importantly, I think today this is an opportunity for you to also you know, get an, a, a chance to be even more mindful, to understand what that means, to understand her journey, and perhaps see yourself, yourself reflected in what she shares with us today. If you are watching this live, please share this on your timeline so that other people in your, in your neck of the woods could check it out and you'll also be able to connect and have con meaningful conversations about this. If you're watching this recording, again, share it, send it to other people. And if you've just stumbled across this and you want to make sure that these uh, conversations and interviews that we do every week end up in your inbox, you want to go to www.timetocomealive.com to subscribe and you'll get the interviews and as well as the contact information of the individuals that I have as guests directly in your inbox. So looking forward to, to adding more people to our community. All right, Dorsey, thank you so much for being a guest here today. I am so grateful that you have the, that you have the, courage, I, I would say that, <laughs> to come on a show with for someone that you barely know. I met Dorsey actually just on the phone. Today is the first time we're actually seeing each other because I was introduced to you by a, a mutual friend, Katie, Katie Troutman. So shout out to you, Katie. Thank you so much. And uh, one of the things that I was really committed to in 2020 was looking at how to expand my reach to connect with different people, people that I don't necessarily know. Last year, I found that most of the people that I interviewed in my podcast, at least 90, let's say 98% of them, I knew I was either friends or they were friends of friends, but I was somehow acquainted with them. And I really wanted to expand myself beyond that today. So Katie, thank you so much for being a, a, a member of my tribe that will help me accomplish that goal. And Dorsey, thanks to you for coming on board. Um, because of your role as Chief Mindf Mindfulness Officer, I thought it would be wonderful for you to start off our conversation with a mindfulness exercise as we tend to on this particular program. And then we can talk some more about who you are and your background. You good with that? That sounds great, Valerie. Yay! Take it away. All right. So if you're in a place where you can, go ahead and let your eyes softly close down. So just bringing the attention inwards for a moment. And we'll take a few breaths together. So inviting an inhale through the nose and releasing the breath out the mouth. Two more deep cycles of breath. Last deep breath in and letting it go. And taking a moment to thank yourself for taking this time to invest in you by learning and growing with this podcast, this conversation. I'm just giving you the opportunity now to set an intention for your time listening to this podcast. Maybe it's simply to be present, to listen. Maybe there's something specific that you're looking for. through these simple practices of breath awareness and conscious intention is to bring ourselves more fully into the here and now. It's 
take one last breath together in through the nose and out through the mouth. And gently blinking open your eyes and coming back into the space. I feel renewed, restored. <laughs> Sometimes you. it just takes a breath, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, last night I had to drive one of my mentees. I mentor a group of young people and she was going to a dance audition, uh, high school, you know, she says eighth grader. And she was telling me how nervous and how nervous and how nervous she was all the way there. <laughs> and I said, are you breathing? No, miss, I'm not breathing. I'm like, all right, let's breathe. So when we got to the parking lot, we did a little breathing exercise. And it didn't necessarily completely remove her nerves, but I think she started to realize how little she was breathing and how mm -hmm. that contributes sometimes to that anxiety and the tightness. So yes, thank you very much for that. Um, so Dorsey, how, tell us a little bit about yourself. What, what has you be such a, first of all, chief mindfulness officer, I, don't, I think you're the first and only person I've met with that title before. So I'm, I'm really fascinated about what is it that had you become this uh, or take on this particular role in your life? Yeah, Valerie, that's a great question. And it's, it could be a very long answer, but <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Um, so it's yeah, only an I hour have... show, Dorsey. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have the pleasure of running a company called Mastermind. Um, and my role there is overseeing everything from, you know, our daily operations, managing our teachers, engaging with corporate and community clients to um, really writing a lot of our mindfulness curriculum and doing a lot of the teaching in front of corporate audiences and community audiences. Um, so it seemed appropriate also, you know, I'm someone as a practitioner and teacher of mindfulness that it's so easy to compartmentalize, you know, and say, oh, I practice mindfulness in the morning, but can you really bring that into your whole life, into the way you do business, the way you relate to people? And so for me, that title of chief mindfulness officer is a reminder, you know, every time I sign my signature at the bottom of an email, am I living what I'm teaching? <laughs> yes. Now, okay. Did you come up with the title yourself? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, when I stepped into the role of, of running the company, it, it just was something that, that made sense as we're a meditation and mindfulness company. So. <laughs> then it does make sense. I, I, I love what you said about having, knowing that you now have to embody this quality <laughs> in all areas of life, because you're right these days, the word mindfulness has been you know, spoken of so much more often than I think 10, 15 years ago. And you also get a sense that it's so tied to a yoga practice, meditation practice, but really the term mindfulness is about, you know, embodying the present moment and just being in the moment. And I'm curious about, let's just talk about today. When you think about between the time you opened your eyes to now that you're sitting here, what does mindfulness look like in your, in your day or what has it looked like today? Yeah, that's a great question, Valerie. So um, the second I open my eyes, I try to actually feel my body in the bed and like enjoy that feeling. I have, my mom got me these Ugg socks for Christmas that make my feet feel amazing when I wake up because they're actually warm. And so I try to savor that feeling of warm feet and find gratitude for that <laughs> little moment of joy. Um, mm -hmm. I do a little, I try to imitate my cat um, who cuddles with me. And so I do a little bit of stretching too when I wake up just to feel into my body. And I try, you know, I do the same thing every morning, making lime water, making tea. So it's easy to slip kind of into that routine and go on autopilot. Um, but I try to take little moments to, to taste my tea, to close my eyes and enjoy it. Um, I have a daily practice um, in the mornings, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes of seated meditation, gratitude journaling, um, sometimes some mindful movement, depending on time constraints. So I have the formal practice, but I'd say what really gets me and is why I enjoy mindfulness so much is those little moments of actually bringing that mindfulness into daily life. There's a quote from John Kabat-Zinn that I love, which is the real meditation is how you live your life. Mm -hmm. And so coming back again to that, that um, theme of trying to live what I'm teaching, not just for those 45 minutes in the morning, but really yeah. throughout my day. Oh, wow. 
I, I'm trying to think if this morning I, I even noticed I was in a bed. <laughs> I feel like it was like, oh, it's time, you know, and if I'm, if I'm lucky in the days that I don't use my alarm to wake up, meaning I wake up before the alarm typically, that's when I get enough sleep, which wasn't the case yesterday, <laughs> but, but I do, I will wake up without my alarm and I feel like I relish that, that moment right after waking up and I don't feel like I have to run to the next thing. But I, I, first of all, you got to tell us where those Ugg socks, you, where you can get those Ugg socks because the <laughs> feeling of warm feet, I don't take for granted. I think that's really, <laughs> that's really helpful. Um, but you're right. I think the, upon waking up, that moment is really sacred. You know, if I think about just the gratitude of having another opportunity to open our eyes, because, you know, the alternative is we, we wouldn't be able to talk about it. <laughs> we right. wouldn't have not, yeah, we wouldn't be here to talk. And, and then it sounds like the routine that you have in the morning, being present to that is really important so that it doesn't just become a routine, right? That it becomes a, I don't know, what, what would be the opposite of routine? I don't Let's ponder that. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I think routine <laughs> implies there's some sort of systematic, automatic, robotic behavior that a habit that we don't have to think about, but mm -hmm. I think, and, and this, this question just popped up in my head and, and I want to talk more about your background too, but before this appears from my head, this idea that um, building habits requires us to do something over and over again, right? So it does become automatic. So we don't have to necessarily think about something before we do it and we can more easily integrate it. How do you balance this notion of building habit so that you, you can do it more regularly without any resistance, but also be mindful? Yeah. That's, That's probably question. the best question I'm going to ask today. So <laughs> relish that. <laughs> That's such a great question, Valerie. I feel like I'm going to be thinking about this one um, for a little while. Um, hmm. You know, as a mindfulness and meditation teacher, probably um, the number one intention when I work with clients is to help them create healthy habits. So that the neuroscience of habit formation, as you said, making things more automatic um, and easy to, to practice is really important, right? If we had to consciously choose, decide whether to brush our teeth every night, that would be exhausting, right? Like every little thing. Um, and so I actually, because I study the brain, I love knowing that our brains have that autopilot feature and that habit is kind of a, a safe foundation from which to build and grow. And so I know that if I cultivate these strong morning routines and evening routines, that I'm setting myself up for success. And then the more moments that I can, as I carry out those routines, remember how lucky I am to have them. Um, the gratitude that I no longer have to negotiate with myself whether I'll meditate, how long, right? But that I really get to drop in and enjoy that. Um, you know, I think habits are really something to be grateful for. And when we learn how to work with our minds and use them um, for, for positive, you know, positive demonstrations in our life, I think that's a really positive thing. And I'm not one to, um, you know, I'm really hard on myself. And so one thing that I try not to do with mindfulness is to judge or um, criticize myself for how I live, how I carry out this chief mindfulness officer role in my life, right? I like to look at it as little successes every time I wake up to the moment. And so I set the stage every day, like any time that I realize I'm distracted and come back, like that's a win, that's a success. Every time I stop and like literally smell the flowers or feel my clothes on my skin, like that is the gift of being human. And so I see, I have these strong set of habits. Um, this is what I share with my clients. And then the more as you work through those routines, the more you can actually be present for them, um, the more enjoyment you get out of those routines. That's, that's quite fascinating to think about the more automated something is that it, it, it almost, what I'm hearing is that it's almost like you eliminate the resistance or the, the, the amount of energy that needs to be exerted to practice a particular habit, right? So being able to allow that, that habit or that, uh, 
I don't want to say autopilot, but to, to have the behaviors that just kick on naturally brings, engages a different part of our brain so that we can actually observe what's happening in that moment, as opposed to having to use our bandwidth to carry out what's happening in the moment. That's what I'm yeah. hearing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's, that's deep. <laughs> that's deep. Okay. That, okay. So let's, I just wanted to, to, to get some context for everything that we're talking about here. You clearly, and, and one of the things that we talked about when we first met was your, your love of science. And you've mentioned that there's, there's something about the brain that, that really fascinates you enough to now explore it from this perspective. Tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I love that, Valerie. Um, so I have always been a math and science nerd, for lack of a better word. Um, Such judgment. I, it is a little <laughs> bit of judgment, but I wear it proudly. Um, I think it's the best way to describe, um, you know, honestly, my nickname growing up was Dorky Dorsey. Dorky Dorsey? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, okay, embrace it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I just loved math and science, took as many science courses as I could in high school and was really lucky to go to an all girls school that was really like women in science, STEM, you know, and so I was empowered to go off to school in Philadelphia and pursue mechanical engineering as a degree. And I got into research there. I mean, I just loved everything, learning about how the world works. and. Um, you know, early in my life, loving science looked like studying really hard, getting this engineering degree, and then um, ultimately interning and working for Texas Instruments for five years. And so I got this incredible opportunity with TI to go from a mechanical design engineer, um, working on projector housings, housing the lenses and chips that, you know, project our movies onto the screen of the theater, right? Um, to managing a program to bring um, the DLP chip in the form of a spectrometer, which is a, um, a light machine for lack of a you know, time to explain what it is. But I got to travel all over the world, learn about different aspects of science. And I thought, you know, I thought I was living like the best life. I had spent my 25th birthday in Taiwan overlooking um, the city of Sinchu. And I was like, uh, this is what I'm meant to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because a few months later, all of that traveling and all that stress of launching a product caught up with me. And I had a, a total experience of burnout, um, mental health issues. I was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder and mm -hmm. I had to take some time off of work. And it was like, work had been my whole life. And now I had all this time and space to fill and I still love science, right? And so I started looking like, how can I train my brain for stress resilience? How can I better equip myself to manage the stress of life, right? The stress of working um, and really engineer a life for myself that I loved that wasn't like if I took out one thing, it, that, that would all, you know, everything would disappear. And so um, in those few months off, I started looking at mindfulness, mindfulness research, um, reading a lot of different books. I was already at the time um, studying and practicing yoga and doing some, some teaching a little bit in the community. And so I kind of knew, was familiar with this idea of stillness, but as a type A perfectionist, go-getter, I mean, you could not tell me before that time that it was valuable to sit still and do nothing. Like, mm -hmm. what? Um, but I read all the research, read the philosophy of mindfulness, and I was like, this is something I need to commit to. And um, I'm so grateful that I was like, if, if I need to protect my mental health, if I'm going to be you know, told by doctors what to do, um, I want to be doing something for myself every day too. And so mm. um, shortly after um, that experience, I committed to a daily mindfulness meditation practice and started exploring not just the science in my daily job at TI, but also kind of the science of living. Like we talked about habits, you know, what's a positive um, what are positive habits for me? How do I continue to strengthen my brain? Just like you train your body at the gym, right? Like we, you know, our minds can create a heaven or a hell for us to live in. And I was really obsessed. I still am with this 
you know, what habits can I do on a daily basis to change the way I perceive the world and the way I impact the world? And, you know, it's so often, right, that we go through these really traumatic things in our lives. And then we look back and we say, thank goodness for that. And that was my biggest challenge, but it's also, I mean, that was the catalyst for everything I do today. The commitment to mindfulness meditation, the penchant for sharing it with other people who might be skeptical and type A and like, what is this really about? Um, so in that following year, I started teaching free mindfulness classes at TI, had experiences of flow state, right? Where it was like, this is what I meant to be doing. Um, and so in 2016, I was like, I, I know that my, my um, mission, my, um, my calling is to really do this full time to bring accessible wellness, science-based wellness to people just like me in the corporate world who wouldn't normally see the value of training their minds. Um, so that's a really long answer, but <laughs> that's kind of my colorful. journey of science. No, it's a colorful answer. I, I, I'm curious about the first moment that you thought, that, okay, a mindfulness practice is what I need. You've been diagnosed, you had a yoga practice already, but what was that thought or idea or conversation? What was it that sparked that I need to implement some of this in my life? Yeah, honestly, um, there was a lot of resistance. And so when I think back on that time, all I can remember is like, no, like, don't make me sit still. What am I accomplishing here? You know, I'm still the person that will put um, meditation on a list of, of things for the day, right? Because mm. I'm that person um, that likes the check boxes, the, the streaks on apps of how many days in a row you've done something, right? Um, and so there was so much resistance for me with starting. I think, um, you know, one book that that really changed my life and the way that I perceived the practice of mindfulness was Andy Pudicombe's book, Get Some Headspace. And he's obviously the founder now of Headspace and it's a great meditation app. Um, but, you know, cause I had read a lot of research but I still didn't think that I was a good meditator. Like I thought that I couldn't do it. And the way that Andy described um, the practice of mindfulness I still use this metaphor in all the classes I teach, but that idea that um, our minds are kind of like the sky, right? And a lot of times they're clouds and storms, um, energy, emotions, thoughts passing through. And when we practice mindfulness, we're not trying to get rid of thoughts or have this perfect experience. We're getting up in our airplane, flying through the cloud cover and inhabiting that space of blue sky where we can look down and see the thoughts the obsession about what am I going to do later? What did I do yesterday, right? The emotions of sadness about not being at work for so long. Um, mm -hmm. Those didn't have to go away. You know, you were talking about that girl going to dance class who was so nervous, right? Like yeah. you don't, that doesn't have to go away, but mm -hmm. it can be part of your experience without defining who you are. Um, yeah. Pema Chodron says that you were the sky and everything else is the weather. And just that perspective on life that, that I got from that book in particular really influenced my growing mindfulness practice, right? And, um, and helped me not feel like a failure because I was so distracted every time I sat down to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, you and I shared that I've done some meditation, medita I have a meditative practice as well. And I learned, I guess it was three, four years ago now, for the first time I went to a Vipassana meditation course and 10 days in silence where we were spending up to like eight hours a day in meditation throughout the day, of course, that uh, that experience in and of itself took something. <laughs> I realized that not only being in silence, and when I say silence, I mean, you're not even talking to the people around us, not even making eye contact, our meals, we had uh, the tables were pushed up against the wall. So literally there was no opportunity or even oh. temptation to, to want to engage with the people around us and really just be present to the moments that we were experiencing. And the experience for me was, was, was quite impactful, but I remember feeling at the time it was like, okay, you know, being quiet is actually nice. Most people in my life were surprised <laughs> because I don't, spend a lot of time in silence in front of others, <laughs> but I found that it was 
kind of liberating for me. I, I, I definitely get my energy from people and conversation and, and doing, right? Doing things, taking action. But what I noticed is when I was in an environment where I didn't have to, I didn't have to worry about whether I was, if I looked friendly or if I was being polite or if I needed to be kind or if I needed to be considerate, I had to think of no one else but me and, and my interactions in the day and the meditation practice that we learned and practicing that. It was quite liberating in a way, at least for me, that's, that's what I found. But I also realized that there were ways that I needed to challenge myself. So I'm curious about you in the workplace, having implemented this and you took on this mindfulness habit and what impact did that have in the work you did and the environment that you created around yourself or for others? Yeah, that's a great question, Valerie. And I, yeah, like we, we shared that experience of silent retreat and so many epiphanies come when you set aside that time. So I'm glad that we share that. Um, you know, it's funny. One of the reasons that I left TI so quickly after starting a meditation practice, kind of sharing it with other people is that once I was meditating every day, I worked a lot less. Like I had more intention about what I was doing and it got to the point where I was working four hours a day and, and finishing the work that I had to do as a program manager. And I, I didn't see the work the same way um, because I was so much more focused and intentional um, and my concentration had gotten better. And that kind of added um, benefit of feeling like I did something for myself every day, no matter what the world throws at me, like I've connected to a place within me that that's always at peace and always present. And I know that that's there no matter how many crazy emails I get. Right. Hmm. Um, and so my efficiency really increased after I started meditating and that was really illuminating to me um, in terms of like, this could really be uh, beneficial for other people too, if they would take the time, right? And the other interesting thing that happened, um, you know, with my time away that really changed my perspective was, you know, I was gone for two and a half months and I came back and people around me were like, oh yeah, you were out for like two weeks, right? And I'm like, like they're just living the same day every day over mm. and over again. We're talking about autopilot, right? I mean, mm. it's so easy to get stuck in a rut, not a routine, but like a rut. Mm -hmm. um, and you just kind of settle, I think, for the life that's in front of you. And I did not want to do that. You know, I found this new efficiency. I found um, a new commitment to myself and caring for myself. And I really wanted to continue exploring that and sharing it with other people. And that kind of awareness in the workplace that you're talking about yeah. is what really showed me that this could be so valuable for other people. And I needed to make that my priority. Absolutely. You know, when the first time I did the meditation retreat, I obviously I did have some experiences. I remember coming back into sound again, <laughs> not that we were in some sort of chamber. We obviously there were nature sounds, but coming back into conversation and inter interaction and activity with other people at first was a little bit jarring but the second time i went to that retreat i actually went as a volunteer and in my role i was managing all the 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 female students so my it was kind of like a resident assistant at a university that was basically my role so people came to me when there was some emergency or if there was a scorpion in their room or whatever and so i balanced the, the doing with the hours of meditation because I still meditated with the students throughout the entire 10 days. And what I found interesting is what you just expressed when you had this knowledge, all of a sudden this consciousness that you were more efficient. When I came back into life, I recall having the experience of the emails and all these competing priorities not phasing me. I remember just having, oh, okay, there's another email, but that didn't necessarily, oh my gosh, I have to finish this before I, the, the drama of the day-to-day -day workload didn't impact me the same way. Now, mm -hmm. granted, I've had to maintain that by you know, making sure that my practice was still, <laughs> I, I still had integrity in practicing, but, but it sounds like for you, having had that really, uh, that shift 
and how you process your energy and process that time. Not only had you interact with the work you did differently, but even how you, it sounds like you were perceived differently too. Or at least you noticed that people's perception <laughs> was based on some past, some rut that they'd created for themselves. What, so when you think about the work that you now do with, with these corporations or these individuals, and you mentioned how type A you are and, and how you wanna bring this to others, what do you see is the biggest challenge for that to really take root? for people to make that shift or break out of those ruts? Yeah, um, like another great question, Valerie. I'd say, I think we're really at a tipping point um, right now where there's finally, you know, science is catching up to what we know anecdotally um, from people, these experiences of better concentration or whatever. Um, we can see scientifically those changes in the brain or those, um, you know, changes in behavior. And so I'd say that, the, the science is a really big motivator for the people that I work with. Um, they like to think of it as like a user's guide to their own brain, right? Everyone has a brain. We all want to know how to use it better, make it more efficient so we can be happier and more productive and effective in what we do. Um, and so I see a lot of openness right now in the clients that I work with to mindfulness when it's positioned in a particular way, um, following some of the scientific benefits, um, as a, a secular science-based practice, right? Um, I think we, there's still these leftover connotations for meditation from the 60s and 70s. Um, the, you know, a lot of the Asian meditation practices were brought over to the U.S. by hippies. And so people still think of meditation as a hippie thing just because of how it was originally presented in the U.S. And so I think we're gaining traction in terms of, oh, it's a science-based, um, you know, you see articles in the Huffington Post, the New York Times, right? These mainstream news outlets about the benefits of mindfulness. Um, and so I'm seeing more and more curiosity and openness um, from these corporate clients to try it. I'd say one of the biggest barriers that I see to people actually doing it is fear <laughs> of, you know, not knowing what it'll be like, what will happen when I close my eyes and actually pay attention to my mind. Uh, sometimes ignorance can be bliss. And when we open up to like, oh, wow, I've thought about, you know, what that person said to me yesterday 15 times during my meditation, like that, that really is affecting me. Um, and there's a lot of power in the practice of awareness, but I think at first it can be a little bit unnerving to get that window into your mind and to start to seeing what's really there. Um, and so the biggest thing that I do with, with people that I work with is a lot of us, especially type A learners, right? We have this desire to read all the books before we start, you know, like get all the information and, and then maybe we can try to practice. And really the best way to learn how to meditate is to actually meditate and experience it. And so um, I love that you include that, that bit of gathering your energy at the beginning of your podcast. Um, it's sometimes the practice of meditation gets built up to be something that's so big when really mm -hmm. mindfulness can be as simple as rubbing your pointer finger and your thumb together and feeling that sensation um, or feeling the bottom of your feet on the floor and taking a deep breath in and out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say the biggest barrier is the wanting to know everything, some anxiety around actually practicing. Um, and the best antidote to that that I've seen is to get people immediately experiencing the practice and also bolstered by those scientific benefits and the confirmation that mindfulness meditation is not religious at all. It's actually um, a way to enhance your brain and enhance your life. I, I want to talk about two things now. One is you mentioned this idea of people being fearful about noticing what they're experiencing or noticing those thoughts. Talk, t say more about that. What, what have you seen? What have you experienced? What have you, yeah, what, what have you done? Yeah, so I mean, I can, uh, I can relate to this in my own life, I think, um, even, um, you know, that last year I was letting go of a friendship that, that wasn't working anymore. And um, 
I didn't want to feel those feelings, right? And so there was a lot of resistance for me on actually slowing down. I kept myself super busy. Um, I did meditations that were more concentration oriented, so I wouldn't have to drop in and really feel what was going on. <laughs> I'm just telling you all the secrets here. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a, a line in the book, The Alchemist, that I love, which is that fear of suffering is greater than um, the suffering itself is worse than the suffering itself. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot with myself and with others, this fear of really feeling what they're feeling. And in reality, that fear is a lot worse than, than feeling it. Um, and so what's, what's helped me and what I share with my clients are techniques to switch into more of an observer witness perspective with difficult emotions, or even, you know, um, I have clients that have chronic pain and chronic illness. That's just, it's so debilitating and we're not going to fix that, right. Or try to change anything, but we can change the way we relate to those experiences. And one of my favorite practices um, is just feeling the anxiety, for example, or the sadness, noticing where is it in my body? Um, is it hot or cold? Is it changing? Is it static? Is there a shape? Is there a color to it? right? Um, you know, what, is it prickly? Is it, you know, what, and then all of a sudden, I, it's that me in high school being the scientist, right, with my magnifying glass, it's like, what's really happening here? And I lose the attachment to, oh, it's my pain, it's my sadness, I can't do this. And I'm simply observing what's present in the physical body at that moment. Um, and so I think that perspective shift is one of the most powerful things for meditators. And we even see in the, um, in the research that mindfulness meditation is great for managing chronic pain. And they've done studies where they actually look at the activation in meditators and non-meditators brains when they're experiencing pain. And the neuronal firing doesn't change. Um, so they're still experiencing the same level of pain, but they're not, they don't report as being in as much pain or as seeing it as um, a never ending permanent condition and permanent aspect of their lives. And so I think that's one of the biggest gifts of mindfulness meditation is that we can't change what's happening to us, but we can change how we perceive it and how we respond to it and how we move forward. Um, and so I think with, you know, to get back to your original question about people being afraid to be with themselves and be in stillness, we live in a culture that's addicted to constant stimulation and distraction, go, go, go. If someone asks you how you are and you're not busy, like there's something wrong with you, right? And it's really easy to let all of these things get in the way of simply being still. And I think there's a lot more fear around it. Um, and once you actually start practicing it, a lot of that fear goes away and you're able to just kind of be with your experience, whatever it is, as I was mentioning. So I went a lot of different directions with that. <laughs> yes. And we'll tease out a couple of things. I okay. Think one thing is your, the quote that you mentioned from the alchemist, that, yeah, the experience of the, the idea of suffering is what has us suffer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just thinking about it, wanting to avoid it, wanting to, you know, diminish it, all of those, I, is the, the thoughts and how powerful our thoughts are in creating our reality. That, that, and even when you mentioned that, that study that was done, the, the idea of, of pain being managed through thought and the anticipation of pain or the anticipation of it never going away, creating the reality. <laughs> the more we entertain it, the longer or the more pervasive or the more intense it, it, it feels. But I, it's easy, easy to say these things right? It's, it's easy to say, well, you know, it's all in the, it's, it's all in your mind, it's all your thoughts. I, I'm really curious about, you know, you, you, your brain, uh, uh, you, your words, nerd, right? You're <laughs> when it comes to the science, but I, I'm also interested in you sharing a little bit about what's the experience of that individual who does finally allow themselves to peek through that window where, they now get to see or experience their pain or discomfort or fear in a different way. What, what is that experience like to take somebody to that door, take somebody to that window? What's it like for you and what's it like for them? Yeah, um, 
again, a great question, Valerie. Um, By the way, you don't have to validate all my questions. <laughs> I'm just like, I know I'm just pelting you with different things, but I just, I, I'm so fascinated by you get to usher people into an experience of themselves that they may not be willing or able or comfortable confronting and just, wow. Yeah. It's, it's a real, it's really humbling um, to be able to, to guide people in the way and kind of open them up to the experiences that I've had. And I'd say the freedom and the releases that I've experienced when I let go of that resistance right and open up to that window like you were saying um of of what's really happening i i get to facilitate um a class called mindfulness for anxiety and that class is um it's really challenging to facilitate but it's really rewarding um i'd say that in terms of like being a facilitator for something like that when you know and you did this on vipassana right um goenka gets you all like comfortable in your routine, focusing on the nostrils. And then he describes it with the body scan practice of like using a surgical knife to extract the things that are holding us back. And so with facilitating, it's, it's a balance of making people feel really safe and comfortable in the environment that they're in. Um, letting them know that it's normal and natural for things to come up for there to be fear or resistance. And then inviting them in, I'd say, um, mindfulness is it's truly the way I teach it is an invitation to connect with yourself, connect with the environment, um, really, truly. And it's really important to start with a foundation of simple breath and body practices before you dive into what does that anxiety feel like in your body and um, how does it change and shift and what's your emotional response to that. Um, and so there's a whole process. Um, I just started working with some private clients this weekend and there's a whole process that I've created to help people feel comfortable and supported in their practice and then begin to dive a little bit deeper as they're ready. Um, I'd say the most profound experiences that students have are when they slow down enough to realize how much pain they're in in some particular aspect of their lives that they've been not sharing with themselves and I have um, facilitated a class in the fall where we came out of meditation and did some journaling and this we talked about it in pairs and this woman just was bawling and she's you know she runs a communications firm she's like very you know um, power woman right and mm-hmm. she's like I have been taking care of everyone but myself and I didn't realize it until I came to this class and slowed down enough to reflect and learn um, And so people, whether it's over, you know, a four week class, whether it's just a two hour period, giving people um, that feeling of comfort and safety and allowing them to be, you know, they have their foot on the gas pedal or the brake, right? I'm not like go in deeper and like get those things out. It's really, you (laughs) you could stay surface level the whole time. Right. And so it's really up to you. Um, But I know I've spoken to, to so many people who, when they dive deeper, they get that emotional release and emotional healing. And it's, it's an addictive feeling to realize that you have the inner resources within you to manage everything that's going on within you and around you. Oh my goodness. So true. And the, this idea of, of one creating, first of all, obviously you're facilitating this. So you don't, people don't have to come in knowing how to do this, but I think what you pointed to of creating the safety for ourselves is really important and that in just so many areas of life, right? Just feeling safe enough to confront yourself. I mean, wow, <laughs> that, that does um, take not only our abilities, but it really takes, you know, the, it shows how powerful we are that not only we create our own limitations, but we can create our own safety and, and allowance. I, I recall, you know, going back to the, the Vipassana meditation experience I had the first time around after like nine days, they actually lift the silence. I think I may have shared this with you, but they lift the silence and you have the opportunity to interact. And I remember in the interactions I had, they split the men and the women during the course. And so of course women were like, Oh my gosh, I remember, you know, we're, <laughs> we got really excited about finally being able to speak. 
I think the guys were just like, hey, what's up? <laughs> but the women, we just went on and on and, and shared very deeply before the end of the course, which was the next day. So many of them that shared their experience through those nine days had something to say around physical pain, either migraines or, you know, some sort of digestive issue. I mean, there was a lot of physical discomfort beyond just, you know, I was sore from sitting too long, but like really some, some health challenges, even it's a chronic pain that people expressed. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm like, that was really easy for me. Like, I don't, I didn't have any issues. And I recall having been I have torn meniscus in both knees and I, and I didn't want to sit cross-legged during the, the practice. So the nine days I did not sit cross-legged because I didn't want the future pain that I would confront if I did because of my knees. So I, you know, I had all these cushions and I you know, put myself together in such a way that I was always comfortable. But I remember thinking, you know, all these people had these amazing breakthroughs in their physical you know, body, something that they, they, you know, the migraine actually meant something else, you know, the sweaty palms and the, you know, the anxiety and the flush and whatever meant something else. And I'm like, I didn't have any of that. And I had this insight that I didn't really challenge myself physically. So for the last three sittings that, that day and the next day, I sat with my legs crossed. And what was fascinating was, you know, talk about giving myself permission or the safety. I think after nine days of I've, you know, I've done the same thing every single day and I've been okay. I've survived it. Finally created enough safety for me to go, well, maybe I could challenge myself physically and see what happens. Because the idea is that we don't move during the meditation. And I yeah. sat with my legs crossed for the first time in those nine days. And we had an hour long sit. And first 20, 30 minutes, it was fine. I was like, oh, this is really good. I'm actually doing this well. And then all of a sudden, I remember feeling this like almost burning, achy sensation, but not from my knees. It were actually from my hip muscles. And I was like, oh, that's, I was not expecting that. Huh. And it just got progressively and progressively more intense. So by the time we hit an hour, not even an hour before that, I remember just, it was so painful. I wanted to move so badly. And I recall in that instant that I, the moment I was like, why is this hurting so much? This is so painful. Why am I putting myself through this? I realized that that's where I hold so much of my tension in my body, that my hip flexors and my hip muscles and my lower back, that's where it, when, I'm, when I'm scared, when I'm nervous, when I feel like I have to force something, that's the part of my body that gets tight and just, okay, let's power through this, Valerie. Let's make this happen. And I realized, you know, with, I guess like that term, gird your loins, <laughs> it was like, Ugh. tighten up. That's where all of that tension was held. And sitting that way for a long period of time, I couldn't hold the tension anymore. So it naturally needed to relax. And I realized that all the pain that was coming out was all psychological. And I remember just feeling, I just started to cry, just bawl, just because I'm like, oh, that's that. Oh, that's what that is. That's what all that tightness is coming from. And I don't have to tighten up. I don't have to, you know, I don't, I don't have to control. I don't have to protect. I don't have to create. I don't have to force. It was just like, oh, such a release. And the legs, the next, next two sittings um, were not as pleasant, <laughs> still painful, but I remember that night I had the most dreamless sleep that I'd had in the 10 day period. And the very last time we sat, I actually, I would say like 75% of the pain completely disappeared. Yeah. So anyway, I, I just reflected on that because what you said about having this, creating that safety, we, I think have such a beautiful opportunity as human beings to connect with the parts of ourselves that make life really rich and really beautiful. But sometimes we have, you know, we keep the thorns up <laughs> or we keep the gates locked or we don't dust things off and, and, and it diminishes the ability to live life fully. I, I'm curious for you in your own life, uh, Dorsey, can you give us a sense of what it's been like now that you have, you know, knowing that you were diagnosed with bipolar, that you had to build this practice as a result of making sure you maintained um, 
who you are, what, what has it done for your life? How is your life different or yeah, what's been the impact? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. A lot of times when we change, we don't always notice it, right? Cause we're just like incrementally day by day. So mm-hmm. I'd say that the biggest things that have been noticed are actually my family, like people that have been close to me. And, um, you know, I was at texting my dad last year about, I was at a furniture store, Haverty's and I was like, I'm looking for a couch. And, and he's like, Oh my gosh, Haverty's was the scene of your meltdown. I was like, what? He's like, Oh yeah. You know, cause he drove out with me when I moved to Texas in 2012. And, um, he was like, yeah, they couldn't get the couch in the time that you wanted. And you just like let the saleswoman have it. <laughs> Whoa. And I was, I didn't, first of all, I didn't remember it. I probably blocked that out. Um, <laughs> there but, goes the thorns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, oh yeah, that was the old Dorsey. And I don't know. I don't, you know, I have a lot of different opinions about old Dor. Are you always the same person? Are you different versions of yourself? Right. Different mm-hmm. chapters or different books. But I will say that the people I've known since childhood that witnessed me, especially in high school and college where I was really intense on academics. And um, I think you mentioned Valerie in kind of the the intro you wrote for this session about a journey from the head to the heart or the brain Mm -hmm. to the heart. And I'd say in the past five years on my mindfulness journey, um, I've stopped relying so much on my intellect and I've, really invested in cultivating my heart and my heart center, um, my compassion for others and a way of being in the world that actually inspires more mindfulness and compassion in others as well. Mm. Um, you know, we all have our moments, right? There's a, a quote from Ram Dass that I love. He says, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your family. So <laughs> Here, here. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not perfect, right? Like I still have those moments of losing my temper or um, feeling like I can't really drop in and feel something and deal with it. But I'd say that overall, I've invested in cultivating my heart in my presence in a way that I see now everything that happens, whether it's good or bad challenges, successes, right? It's being part of my journey, part of my path and part of my practice. And I have the the ability, the invitation now to open up and trust that as I feel things and move through things, they'll become part of who I am, part of my story and really strengthen my presence, strengthen my heart and how I can impact other people's lives. Hmm. Well, thank goodness for the old Dorsey. (laughs) Well, because one, I think it provides contrast not only for you, but I think that's what life is about. Life is about identifying the contrast because then we know what there is to work on, what there is to do, what is there to take action on when we notice it. And it sounds like it had a a, a profound impact on how your family also perceived you. So I don't know, maybe, maybe you are more enlightened now. (laughs) They they have a, you know, old Dorsey, new Dorsey conversation. (laughs) Um, So Dorsey, I know, obviously, we're, we're getting close to the end here. But I want to First of all, there are so many things that you shared about the benefits of mindfulness and the practice that that not only has transformed your life, but gives people a roadmap to transform theirs. How do people get a hold of you or how do people get information about the classes that you offer or the private sessions that you do? Yeah, thanks, Valerie. Um, So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm the Chief Mindfulness Officer of Mastermind, and you can find us at mastermindmeditate.com. We have um, a resources tab with different blog posts about um, applying mindfulness to different aspects of your life. We have a a library of digital meditations that incorporate that kind of science um, and research learning at the beginning. And also there you'll find a way to sign up for our upcoming classes and our newsletter if you'd like to get um, a discount on your first class when you sign up. And I know you probably have audience all over, um, Valerie, so I'm super excited to share that we just started offering online classes this year. Um, So these are on Zoom as well, and they meet on Tuesday night. Right now we're we're talking about kind of jumpstarting a mindfulness practice next month we'll be diving into the the attitudes of mindfulness or the pillars of mindfulness so 
how do you live that non-judgment that we talked about, right? And how do you bring in practices specific to that and other attitudes? Um, so no matter where you are, I encourage you to, to check us out. And we're, we're growing our community both here in Dallas and then really cultivating these online connections as well, which we believe is the future um, of, of sort of the way that humans connect and nurture each other and being able to cultivate that safe space that we talked about, even mm. in an online setting. So it's a journey and a practice. And I'd be honored if you guys would connect with us there. And also I'll share my social media channels with Valerie Dorothy right. Sandish on Instagram and Facebook and Mastermind Meditate on the same channel. So um, connect with us, continue the conversation and um, enjoy some of the brain health learning and daily mindfulness practices that we share. Oh, fantastic. I'll make sure to take all of the points that you made, the website, as well as your social media handles and place them in the show notes. So guys, you'll have that access. And I'll also include some of the books because you, you mentioned some, some wonderful reading that you've done that also moves forward this conversation. So in case people are interested in Pema Chodron or Ram Das or you know, the, the Alchemist, Paulo Coelho, all of those, I'll be sure to, to include those as well. So if you, you might want to send me a list because you, you gave quite a few. And if there are others <laughs> that you didn't mention that you think will also help people, that would be phenomenal. Great. Well, I... You know, I, I can't have a chief mindfulness officer on this program and not have them <laughs> actually take us out, <laughs> take us out, not, not take us out, but <laughs> to close our session with some mindfulness. So, so Dorsey has offered to do that. Before you do that, though, Dorsey, I do want to encourage those of you who join us next week. We have another wonderful opportunity to connect with them, another person. So January 21st is our next session, nine o'clock on Facebook Live. And then also get on time to www.timetocomealive.com if you want to make sure that you get this in your inbox. Next week, we have Janet Morrison Lane. She's the director of the Vickery Meadows Eagle Scholars Program. It's a college prep program for 7th to 12th graders. We're going to be talking about the importance of sharing and teaching young people how to access college, how to access not only the resources to go to college, but the support system that's necessary for them to be successful when they're there. So looking forward to having that conversation with her and something that not only brings her alive, but also the young people who have the, the fortune of interacting with her. So join us for that next week. Now I'm going to turn it back to Dorsey to usher us out of the program with some mindfulness. Thanks, Valerie. Let's take another minute here just to connect with ourselves. So go ahead and roll the shoulders up, back and down a few times. If you're standing, you might do some bigger stretches, right? One of the biggest benefits of mindfulness is this connection between the mind and the body. So closing the eyes down again, bringing both hands to the area of the belly. We'll take a few more of those deep breaths together. So inhaling into the belly and exhaling out the mouth. Two more like that. One more deep breath into the belly and letting go. Relaxing the hands back into the lap. Remembering that no matter where today or this week takes you, that you have these resources within you. Even just three belly breaths has been shown to help shift our central nervous system from a state of fight or flight into that parasympathetic rest and digest. So taking one last breath in through the nose, sighing out the mouth, curling the corners of your mouth up in a small smile, sealing in your practice and your gratitude to yourself for continuing to learn and grow. And take this time to connect more deeply with yourself in the present moment. Blinking the eyes back open coming back with perhaps a new perspective into the space. <sighs> Beautifully done. Dorsey, thank you so much for your time, your energy, sharing your message with us. And I encourage those of you who are watching and listening to follow Dorsey. There's some things I think in your own life that you'd like to bring to life that she can support you with. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. 
Bye.